So our next speaker is uh, Kevin Mitchell. Kevin is an associate professor of genetics and neuroscience at Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. Um, he studies the genetic programming specifying the wiring of the brain. And I know um, both from hearing people talk about his book and from uh, interactions on Twitter that uh, Kevin's always got uh, really interesting things to say uh, in, uh, on all of these topics. So we're very happy to have him here today. Take it away, Kevin. Well, well uh, thanks a million to the organizers for the opportunity and thanks Blake for that kind introduction. Um, as you can see from this very grandiose title, um, I'm going to give a really conceptual talk. And I, I haven't actually talked about this stuff before uh, very much, so we'll see what you all make of it. Um, it's really about how we think about what the nervous system is doing. And I want to start with this uh, paper, which Tony also started the, the meeting with by McCulloch and Pitts um, about a logical calculus of the ideas imminent in nervous activity. And really, it gave rise to the way of thinking about what the brain is doing as being involved in information processing and logical computations. And I think a lot of the, um, the work in AI that is informed by neuroscience is, is in that space as well, which makes sense. And, and a lot of work in neuroscience is aimed at the question, how do nervous systems work? What are the computational elements? What are the circuit motifs? What are the extended systems? that allow them to do information processing and logical computations. But there's another way to think about this, uh, which is to ask the question, what are nervous systems for? And really they're not just for abstract logical computation or information processing, at least that's not what they evolved to do primarily. They belong to organisms that are active causal agents that do things in the world. They're selves with aims and with purpose uh, and the nervous system really is designed not just for processing information, but for making sense of it, for extracting meaning and value and thereby guiding action. Now, a lot of those terms that I just used there are a bit nebulous and they don't sound very scientific. Things like purpose and selves and meaning and value. And, and in fact, meaning in particular has, I think, been banished from polite scientific discourse. We talk about information because we can measure it. Meaning is just a bit more ethereal and doesn't sound like it's a real thing at all. It's very suspect. But um, I think that we can build a, a scientific framework for agency. But to do that, I think we have to look at how it evolved. We have to go back right to the very beginning and ask, actually, what is life? And Erwin Schrodinger um, in the 1940s had a, a great book on this which basically framed it from the physics point of view as an improbable pattern of matter that is resistant to the second law of thermodynamics. So it's self-sustaining, it's self-replicating, and it's self-organizing. And you can think about how this might have arisen from very simple sort of um, autocatalytic sets of molecules that maybe catalyzed each other's um, formation to something that got uh, surrounded by a bubble, maybe a little fat bubble, um, to something that could make its own boundary. And now you're starting to get to a self-sustaining system that has some autonomy. It has some thermodynamic insulation from the, uh, from the storm outside. Um, and maybe we could call that an entity, but, but it's not doing very much yet. Um, within it, what you've got is, is metabolism, some sort of cycle of, of molecules doing something, making each other um, in a closed kind of complete set. And hopefully you've got replication. So the whole thing could be replicated. And originally maybe the first molecules might've done both the metabolism and the replication, but over time, those could have been um, se segregated so that you can get persistence of the whole pattern by having an information template that tells you what the pattern should be. So if there's some perturbation to the system, the template can, can write the system. But more importantly, it can be replicated. And that means the system, the whole pattern, can persist not in the individual, but over time as the pattern gets, um, gets replicated. Now, the crucial thing here is that if you're using that genetic material, that's a substrate for evolution. So that becomes, um, becomes amenable to selection. And this is where the magic really happens in this extraordinarily simple, even simplistic way of looking at things. Things that have the property of tending to persist, persist. And things that don't, don't. 
that just sounds moronic when you say it like that, but it's absolutely profound because it's the basis for all life. And that algorithm of uh, things that out persist others coming to predominate, if there's a, a population of things, some of which are better at, at, at persisting and replicating than others, just means that you now have selves with aims. Their aim is to persist. So if they want to persist, then they can, within their little bubble, keep their metabolism going. But uh, if the environment changes, then that might be bad. So they might want to be able to adapt to that by having some way to get information from the outside. And so you could have things that evolve with sensors and then things that evolve with motors. So now you've got something that never was there before. You've got agents that can move in the universe and they can act on other things in, in the world. And they might, for example, want to move away from dangerous things and towards uh, things that are food. Now you've got something really interesting. You've got meaning. These things in the environment now mean something to this little entity relative to its aim of persisting. So you've got the origins of meaning, at least. Those, those signals mean something relative to this aim but that only comes about through feedback from natural selection. So it doesn't, the, the meaning, the value doesn't inhere in the signal. It doesn't inhere in the thing out in the world. It's only through feedback from natural selection, which is really the ultimate uh, reinforcement learning mechanism. If you make the wrong choice, you're dead. That the, this whole loop now has meaning, the organism uh, through, this, through this history. And of course, it's not semantic meaning. It doesn't understand anything. It's just a pragmatic consequence, approach or, or avoidance but it's the start of something where you can see the instincts or priors or inductive biases, whatever you wanna call them, are configured into the biochemistry even of a single cell and they're encoded in its genome. So, so now when we start to think about, okay, let's, let's fast forward millions and millions of years, we got multicellularity and the invention of nervous systems. Well, they're doing the exact same thing. It's just more elaborate. So if we think about something like a comb jelly, really, really simple basal, um, organism, uh, animal, then the first thing that nervous systems can do in, in an organism like this is coordinate all the muscles. Because it's multicellular, you have to be able to know that you can move the muscles on one side versus another in order to do something useful. So you're not just having a spasm, you're, you're moving left or you're, or you're moving right. So the nerve net, even in a simple organism like that, basically already defines a repertoire of action. You can do action A or B or C, but you can't do them at the same time time. And once you connect those to sensory information, then you can also know if I see this signal, I should do A. If I see that signal, I should do B. And again, what you're doing is pre-configuring all of that action selection into the circuitry and you're encoding that in the genome. Of course, the nice thing about uh, nervous systems is they can learn. So you can reconfigure that circuitry throughout the life of the animal. Now, as uh, nervous systems get more complex, you get more and more removed from the immediacy of the environment. You can decouple the sensory information from the action. So you don't only have pragmatic meaning, now you can get actually semantic meaning. You can generate internal representations of that signal to the next level of the hierarchy. So you can have symbolic um, representations and some kind of semantic um, representations that can be operated on within the nervous system. That gives you obviously the opportunity to integrate multiple signals to assess uh, a whole situation by extracting more complex features. And then what you're doing is internalizing the action selection loops. You have internal critical systems, value signals, etc. You don't have to rely on just whether you're trying something and seeing if you die or not. Um, you can actually imagine consequences of actions based on previous experience and so on. So you get these whole uh, incredibly complicated systems and mechanisms that are there to mediate these, um, these judgments on what the situation is that you're in relative to your memories and experiences, relative to your, to your goals at any given time. And then you can uh, choose, again, the output here is the same as even in a single cell. You choose one action to do and you suppress all the other possible actions. Now, in looking at something like this, I'm generally surveying the neuroscience field lately, where there's been just tremendous progress in understanding the circuit mechanisms of all kinds of, of, of behaviors. You can 
end up in a point where we become, I, I think, victims of our own success, where the, the, there's a tendency to move to a kind of eliminative reductionism. So the idea would be that all of these things that we look at in psychology, mental states and goals and beliefs and intentions and choices really can be reduced to neural activity patterns and circuit computations. They're nothing more than those kinds of, uh, of behaviors, sorry, or, or um, patterns within, within the brain. And if you want to take that further, you can say ultimately all of this is just reducible to atoms obeying deterministic laws of physics. So it's just pure mechanism. And that really doesn't explain these kinds of things. It explains them away and says that they're just epiphenomena. I don't believe that that's true, but it's a popular um, position in, in neuroscience, actually. One of the reasons to think it's not true, well, first of all, the universe isn't deterministic. Um, there's lots of randomness and there's lots of noise at multiple levels, but also each neuron is just a black box to the next neuron. The low level details are lost in synaptic transmission. They're filtered out, they're integrated. We see population manifolds like uh, Sarah Solia was talking about, even polytopes as uh, Conrad was just talking about. So really far from it being the case that these higher level things don't do anything, in fact, they do everything. What matters is what the patterns mean to the organism in its uh, history, uh, both evolutionarily and in its own lifetime, relative to its aims, which the, the, the ultimate aim is survival. But of course, more sophisticated ones have more proximal sub-goals um, that, that, that affect its behavior at any moment. So the instead of thinking as, as this as being where, where the real action is, the real action is here actually. And these sorts of things are just how this level is, is realized. So this is like the, the machine code in a computer that's realizing the algorithms that you've, that you've programmed in. So what I would say is that actually the patterns of neural activity have causal power solely by virtue of their meaning, which is slightly a different perspective, I think, on the purely mechanistic and certainly the reductionist uh, way of thinking about neuroscience. So just to sum up then, I, I don't know what any of this means for AI, frankly. Um, I'm, I'm a neophyte here and just enjoying um, the discussions, but maybe I think to get artificial intelligence, you may have to create artificial life and actually to get understanding that is in some way grounded, you may need an organism that has meaning. And you may need to build an agent that can interact with the world and give it a reason to care. So I will leave it there. Thanks very much for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kevin, for a really interesting talk. So I, uh, we've got a couple of questions here. And I want to start with one um, from uh, John Krakauer, which I think is a uh, good one. It's, it's uh, you know, slightly, it's going to push you a little bit in a way that I think will be interesting to see how you react. So he asks, have you not just pulled the semantic rabbit out of the evolutionary hat? Effectively saying it, it happened. Like, yeah, what, yeah. What's the actual solution provided here? Sure. I mean, that's a great question. And you'll see I skipped over, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of years of evolution in, in one from going from one slide to the next. And that, um, that transition from pragmatic consequential meaning to, um, to semantic meaning is a really key step. And it's, uh, it's still, I think, you know, partly mysterious and, and, and open to argumentation. I think you can think about semantic meaning in, in terms of whether, uh, whether the thing becomes a signal that is passed to another level of the hierarchy. At least that's, that's the way that I think of it, or at least it's, Maybe semantic is not the right word. Maybe just symbolic is the right word in that case. And maybe you need to get to um, enough levels of the hierarchy where you're thinking about thinking to, to actually have semantic content, content that could ultimately be expressed uh, in language, for example. So, so that's the ultimate representation of the point when we get to language, then we know for sure that we have semantic representation. Um, and we know that's the user interface with the machine code of our, of our neurons firing, but right? I'm making your neurons fire right now by saying the things I'm saying. So um, yeah, there's a long, long trajectory to get from pragmatic to semantic meaning. And uh, because this is only a 10 minute talk, 
um, I just skipped it in, in uh, the briefest moment. Fair enough. Um, but good, okay, thank you. Um, so here's a, actually a comment that came up from uh, Tony Zador uh, that I would like to get your thoughts on. He wonders whether or not the agenda of circuit neuroscience is not in fact to eliminate the higher level psychological explanations, but rather to find the right high level explanations that align with the underlying mechanisms and, and, and connect them effectively. So, so I wonder if you can comment on that. Do you really think circuit neuroscience is attempting to eliminate these higher level explanations or, or link up to them and find the ones that actually have meaningful connections to the physiology? Yeah, I would, I would hope um, that, that it's the latter, that they're trying to illuminate rather than eliminate. Um, but uh, so, so when I was saying that, that, you know, there's a popular view in neuroscience that, um, that it's all mechanism. Uh, I certainly did not mean to say that that's the, the that that's a unanimous view by any means. There are lots of people thinking about things that that are trying to connect the circuitry to the behaviors that that they carry out and the, the cognitive functions and operations that underlie them and so on. Um, <clears throat> but there is a, certainly a strong uh, strong vein of eliminative reductionism that philosophically runs through um, a lot of of neuroscience and and you know and philosophy as well and uh, so when it comes to you know uh, arguments about free will which is where a lot of this um, these 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 points of view come up you can certainly see tons of people advocating that view now maybe they're more uh, physicists than than neuroscientists but you know I think Patrick Haggard for example um, you know Sam Harris as, as a popularizing um, neuroscientist would certainly be in that view that it's all mechanism uh, and um, you know that the that there's only an illusion of choice and there's an illusion of agency but actually we're not in control it's all just being driven by the nuts and bolts and the ions moving around and the channels opening and closing so it, it, it's all machine and um, really I guess what I'm trying to do is, is, is put a, a countervailing argument that actually what's driving the machine is the meaning. Okay, interesting. Um, next question from Maximilian again. Uh, do you think Breitenberg's vehicles have meaning? So I structures that have no built-in goals but behave as if they do given how they interact with the environment. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And when you think about, you know, very simple robots, then we're, we're into that area of an overlap with, um, with, with the, you know, the, the, the two fields um, represented here. So the, the as if question is really a deep philosophical one. And actually, you could get to, you know, someone like Daniel Dennett, who would say, we behave as if we have intentions and goals, and so on. And that's a convenient way of talking about us. But in reality, it's all still the, the, the nuts and bolts down there. Um, so yeah, I, there's, not, there's not a tight line, right? At some point, as if you're, you know, an amoeba behaves as if it wants to go towards a food source. It doesn't want to, but the pragmatic effect of the way that it's wired, it makes it as if it does want to. At some point, as if becomes wanting, right? Um, I don't know where that, the, I don't think there's a bright line there. I think it's a really, really tough philosophical nut to crack actually. Um, and I, uh, in, in just in relation to Breitenberg vehicles, I, I, I don't know what to think about them in particular. Okay, thank you. Uh, time for one more question from Hal Greenwald. What does it really mean for an artificial agent to care, do you think? There's motivation and example uh, motivation and emotion, for example, but how do you envision that such concepts might be translated into artificial agents in a meaningful way? Yeah, um, well, so that's the deep question, right? And that, that uh, you know, my final slide was, a, uh, a, a, I guess, a, a challenge in that I was suggesting you might have to have an agent that cares. You might have to give it a reason to care, but I'm not sure exactly how to do that. Um, I think, you know, one of the questions, I guess, if we're thinking about understanding, how do we get to something that understands, is whether its meaning is grounded in any way. Because obviously you can put value functions into an AI or you can put motivational functions into a robot, 
um, maybe it has to have some subjectivity to it that, that, that for, for, for that to be grounded in, in some way. And again, I mean, there's a re it's a really, really deep philosophical question. I don't, don't in any way claim to have an answer to it. Um, but I think that the, the idea of grounding learning through active exploration in an environment may be part of at least how that happens in humans. And, and actually getting back to, you know, the genomic encoding of, of priors and inductive biases, I think that grounding has to start somewhere. You know, something has to, it has to feel like something the first time you start exploring. Well, where does that feeling come from? There has to that that can only be pre-wired in, which is then really does your head in. How do you pre-wire in what it feels like to do something? I don't know how you do that either. So then now we're in really dangerous philosophical territory of qualia and all sorts. Of I have all sorts of very strong opinions about this, but we have neither the time nor am I in the right uh, uh, place to do this right now. So um anyway that was fascinating thank you very much kevin um thanks very much and uh thank you everyone for your great questions again